thing for me. Thank you so much, Miss Esther, for that song. I'm going to invite the children. Children are invited to the children's church at this time. Brother Jeremiah is back there now, and uh, we're welcome. You're welcome to go back there. Uh, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. As uh, as you're turning there, I want to um, want to emphasize uh, where we've been. We've been uh, going through the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be finishing today, and. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of, it's only 16 chapters, so it's not an incredibly long book, and it's taken us uh, some 25 weeks or so to get through, I mean, 30 weeks, uh, started beginning of last summer, and so, uh, wow, I guess it's, it's been like 40 weeks or something like that, I didn't realize that, I thought we were going pretty quick. Anyways, uh, 1 Corinthians 16 has, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians has been going through a lot of information dealing with issues in the church. Now, um, they're, they're, they're presented with a few problems. One is that they are a very carnal church. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, it describes them as being carnal. And there's issues even with the, uh, the way that they're following people. For instance, some people like Apollos and some like Paul and, and even some reference that some like Cephas and uh, Jesus Christ. Some people are like, oh, well, we were followers of Jesus only, of the Savior. But with this, even though they would claim to follow the Savior, he says, are you not yet carnal? In other words, you guys are still carnal, fleshly. You're still focused on externals. You're focused on the way you feel. You're focused on everything except what's important. And what he's saying is that they're one in Jesus Christ. And being one in Christ, they really should be focusing on Christ himself. And anybody that's leading them should be leading them to Christ himself. And that's the whole point of it. He's saying, look, you're, you're a carnal church. You've got problems. And and uh, now I'm not uh, I'm not saying that we should be happy when people fail, but when some of our heroes fail, it shows something. It shows their humanity, right? It does. I, I've uh, I've been to different things where like acrobats perform things. My wife and I one time we were in, uh, in Tennessee and where we had gotten married, where she was from, and uh, we were we were staying at a hotel and they had this show like right out. And um, and anyways, these these guys are. They're dressed these, like these normal looking people uh, pull out these two poles and they're like big long 12 foot poles and uh, just this two of them and uh, anyways they set them on the ground not in the ground but on the ground like literally just like standing there and uh, and like five or six of them started like climbing up these poles and jumping from one to the other they're not attached to anything and they're climbing all the way up and jumping from one to the other and connecting them and uh, like holding each other up. And it was incredible. And it's not like they're using both like stilts. I mean, they're literally like climbing up like one pole and with multiple people. And I mean, this is really I was I was pretty amazed by it. But I wonder, like, how many times did they have to practice this before they got it right? And uh, at one point, we're like, you know what? I think I'm pretty good now at 12 foot <laughs> where I can do that. And like at one point, a guy stands on top with one hand and just balances himself on one of the poles like upside down. Like, where are you like, you know what, I think I got this. I think I got this. No, I mean, it's just not possible. You see people doing this with a Grand Canyon. How many times did they fall? The truth is it took some time to get to those places where they could finally do that. And when we see people like in the Bible, like Paul, like Paul never does anything wrong. And then yet it's interesting that when you find people in the scriptures, almost all of them, it gives you some information to show that they're human and they have struggles. Even David, who God says is a man after his own heart, that's some issues, like having people killed. That's pretty bad. I've never done that. I mean, I'd be like, ha, David, I've done stuff, but not that. Okay, so maybe, except for the fact that it's, I, I have that humanity about me as well, things that I'm struggling with. And so anyways, when you get to this, you see the first, one of the first churches in, in existence as far as in the New Testament age, when you have people that are, um, that, that the church is going forth, people getting saved, and the church is established throughout the world. And, and one of the first churches is there in Corinth, and uh, it's in the region called Achaia. Achaia, if, uh, if you look at the, um, the Greek isthmus, um, the Greece, you have uh, the bottom portion, which almost looks like an island, but it's not fully detached, and just a little bit above it. That's Athens and Greece. I'm sorry, that's, that's Greece. It's a region called Achaia. You have Athens and Corinth. And so it's a shipping area. A lot of commerce goes through there. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Anyways, Corinth is a very popular place, and it's a nice place, and it's beautiful. And uh, anyway, it's still around. And, um, and this area that, that we're talking about here, who he's writing to, a lot of important people come out of there, like people like Apollos, who Apollos, uh, I don't know, he's like a silver-tongued orator. I've heard of people um, uh, reference uh, William Jennings Bryant. I don't know, has anybody heard of who that is? Uh, that's uh, in American history. It wasn't in the Bible, right? There's not a William Jennings Bryant in the Bible. But anyways, he ran for president like a bunch of times and never won. But um, 
Okay, on a historical side, here's what happened. William Jennings Bryant was a lawyer. He actually tried the, the case there uh, against Darrow that allowed evolution to come into our public schools to be taught there, and he's, he lost that case. And so uh, down in, um, in, in Tennessee. And so that's where it all went wrong before that. Anyway, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, but people said about the way he would speak, and they, they, they transcribed a lot of his, uh, his messages. He preached as well and, and gave a lot of um, lectures and, and, and uh, speeches and stuff. And they talked about him being this silver-tongued orator. And everything he said was just amazing. And the way he would put words together and the word usage that he had was just like an artist with words. Uh, people said that about different preachers throughout history. Uh, it's amazing that that newspapers like the New York Times used to follow people around like, uh, like Bob Jones Sr., the older Bob Jones, and they would follow around his meetings and they would publish his, his messages in the newspaper for national circulation. A lot has changed since then, obviously, as far as what's in the newspaper. If, if, I don't even know that I've seen a newspaper in a long time, but regardless, if it was there, that they wouldn't be in there anymore. And anyways, you have all those things that are going on as far as a silver-tongued orator, people that enjoy hearing them and listening. Even if they don't believe it, they love listening to this kind of thing. And Apollos, the Bible describes him as being this type of guy, uh, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. And so anyways, this guy's from Corinth. And you have, you have different people that are going to be mentioned. And when you look at chapter number 16, you've got some big shots there. Some of the big names in early Christianity right here from Corinth. And uh, at least coming from there, Aquila and Priscilla that are... That are, that are um, that, that were there as far as, uh, as tent makers. This is where Paul stayed with them uh, while he was there in Corinth. A lot of information, a lot of people that are going to be listed here. But anyways, all of that is saying, yes, there were some names that were doing well, but the church as a whole was still carnal. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to. And uh, so they were carnal. And uh, ultimately what we find, and as far as the way it seems to be building, it goes all the way to chapter 13, where in chapter number 13, it gives a lot of information about love. Now, he's not giving them information on love because they're doing such a good job loving people and being the Christians they should be. He's telling them, look, you got problems. This is what true love ought to be. And love, love shouldn't just be a, a sentiment, it should, which a sentiment is important. But the point on love is that it should be a characteristic of an individual that is giving their life for others, that they are living for others, they're serving them, they're making it about them. They're not pleasing themselves, they're pleasing others with, for their edification, as we had talked about in Sunday school today um, and last week. And so anyways, this, this is what, where we've been at, love. So when you have a problem with carnality, which is a me focus, then love would be the outward focus. The term is charity in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a great term, great word. And so anyways, um, we look down now into what he's going to tell us. We, we uh, left off last week in verse number 10, talked about Timotheus, Timothy. There's, there's two books of the Bible, First and Second Timothy. First and Second Timothy. And I know how to use those. All right, First and Second Timothy, uh, which is, this is the Timothy he's talking about. Paul addresses Timothy, at least we assume it's his Timothy. And uh, anyway, he's a preacher, and he's selecting leadership in these churches and, and, and uh, being instructed of God as far as how to do certain things. Uh, he's, a, he's a student of Paul. And so anyway, some of our scriptures are based off of written, what's written to Timothy. And then, um, and anyways, that's what's mentioned in verse number 10. talks about Apollos in verse number 11, uh, verse number 12, excuse me, that um, basically he doesn't want to come over there right now. And so I'm not going to preach a message in verse number 12. I really tried to figure out how to tie this one in. Basically, he didn't have a desire to go back to Corinth at the time. I'm not saying that he didn't like Corinth. Maybe he did. It's interesting that when he tells them from the first and third chapter that there's people that follow Apollos, and uh, they're talking about people that are going to be coming through Corinth, he says, yeah, Apollos isn't going to be one of them, which is interesting. He said, hey, some of you guys are following, and you're carnal, and you're divisive, and uh, this guy that you, like a third of you really love, he doesn't even want to go. Right? He doesn't want to come back. Now, speculation, complete speculation, zero foundation of Scripture on my end. But I tend to believe he's like, that's a mess over there. I'm going to stick with doing this. It's good over here. It's fruitful. People are getting saved. I'm not going to go over there right now. Paul sent him a letter, all right? And so he's saying, I don't want to go yet, but he will when it's, when it's convenient, is what the Bible says. So anyways, but we're going to start in verse number 12. And verse number 12 says, as touching, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 13, I apologize. Verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Notice what it said there, let it be done with charity, colon. Now, if it has a colon, anybody, any of our grammarians here, what does a colon mean at the, uh, this part of, of a sentence? What would that mean? All right, he's going to give examples. All right, so in other words, what's to come, 
is this. So here's what I'm saying. What we're about to read are the things that should be done. It's interesting. They're carnal. Chapter 13 says love is the solution. Even the application of spiritual gifts should be by love. And then he's going to give us in chapter 16, he's going to give us more specific that all these things should be done through charity, colon, and here it is. And so this, this morning, we're going to talk about God's people, God's work. This is what we're talking about, God's people, God's work. This is a work of God. It means it has to be done in the way God wants us to do it. But it's very easy to get carnal. And you know why? Uh, you should know why. Uh, for instance, you woke up this morning, you got one hour less of sleep. How many of you felt a little bit carnal? All right. Uh, like your, your back needed another hour of sleep. Your, your, um, your, your breath needed another hour of sleep, whatever it may have been. Uh, you know, it's funny that you're, you have one hour less and yet you have more buildup on your eyes that morning. You know what I mean? It's kind of gross, but it's just how it happens. And so we get, we get this idea. We feel it. We feel it. And why does the flesh bother so much? It's because we feel it. We feel more tired. We feel the aggravation. We notice the looks. We catch all of that. And it's all about the flesh. And he's saying the answer then is to carnality is love. And what's the point about love? Well, he's going to give you some information about a mindset. But in chapter 16, we're going to see really the most practical aspect of how that should be done and the way it's going to be applied to other people. So when I used to read this, I would think, well, this is just kind of goodbye, kind of like go, goodbye and hello. How often do we pay attention to the words that we say as far as what kind of goodbye? Sometimes we'll say a goodbye that we remember, but most of the time it's like, see you later, goodbye. We don't really know. We don't remember. I mean, think about some of the people that you saw this week. When you left work on Friday, what kind of goodbye did you give to your boss? Did you say, see you later, goodbye, uh, see you Monday, whatever it was. Most of the time, we don't know, and here's why, because we don't care. It's goodbye. It's like, I've got to put a cap on it somehow, and there it is. And the body of the conversation mattered more to us. We do the same thing with hellos. Intros and conclusions seem to be less interesting because it's not the body of information that we're going towards. But yet the intro in 1 Corinthians and the ending are vitally important. Obviously, that's going to be the case in all Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So that means in its profitability, it's profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished. Here's what he's saying. Unto all good works. He's saying that even in this goodbye, it's something that's going to be good for you. So here's what I love about it. It's not just an intro or a conclusion to a, to a series in the book of 1 Corinthians. He's saying this is something very important for you to understand. What we're going to look, about, look at is God's people, God's work. It's got to be done his way. Within the context of love, he's going to give us several admonitions as far as how we should do these things by practical application towards certain individuals. So let's pray. Lord, I ask your blessing on this message, knowing that of my own power, I cannot affect the heart, the soul, uh, the spirit of any individual. So I'm asking that you would do it. Please use your scriptures to instruct us, to help us in the way in which we, we um, apply the things that are given here. Lord, truly that we would love and love more practically. We would love in the manner in which you want us to love. And, and not just to have a feeling of it, but truly to have an application of it. Lord, we love you. We are thankful for what you've given. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get started in this passage, uh, as far as the application of love, it's interesting, one of the last things that Paul addresses, I'm sorry, that, that Jesus addresses to his disciples, uh, to Peter in particular, is uh, when they're eating around this fire after they've been fishing, caught no fish until Jesus said, cast to the other side. They leave all those fish and Jesus has fish already. All right, so they come back and they eat this fish. And one of the things that he tells them has to do with the way in which they're supposed to love the individuals around there. They're supposed to feed the sheep, feed the sheep. But it's in context of lovest thou me. So here's, here's the context of this. And Jesus telling, asking the question, lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou me more than these? He tells them to feed my sheep. So what we're seeing is an application. You're supposed to love, and you do so by doing the work I told you to do. It's application. He is not saying for us that you need to start saying, I love you all the time. And sometimes we get this picture of Christianity that's supposed to be like that, that we just kind of say, I love you more, and that's going to be okay. Uh, it's funny seeing um, intercepting <coughs> love letters from teenagers. Not that I ever do on purpose, uh, but occasionally we'll find them. And we haven't found them here at all yet, but I have found them in the past. And uh, anyways... Um, Half the letter is like nonsense, and the other half is I love you. It was like written down a bunch of different times, you know, and just kind of over and over again. And it's, and anyways, um, but as long as it's said, that's fine. But then they'll fight, they hate each other, but I love you. And you say over and over and over again. And as long as we say it a lot, we feel better about it. 
Valentine's Day. Everybody's happy. Why? Because we just paste that phrase everywhere. It's not sufficient to say, I love you. There has to be some kind of practice involved in that that's actually carrying out practically love. And so what we see here is this application of the love that we're supposed to have God. In other words, the love we're talking about is not towards us. It's towards them. Not internal, external. It's not something for me, but for others. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, which is a cool name, that it, it is the first fruits of Achaia, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. In this, he starts off first referencing something. He references one of the first families that was saved there in Achaia, in the, the area that you guys are in, in, in Corinth. In Achaia, one of the first families that was saved was Stephanus and his household. And so it starts talking about these individuals who first accepted Christ. The idea of first fruits would be the, the first planted and first the, that's grown and then the first harvested. The reason why it's first fruits is because you're harvesting, you're, you're taking your first growth as far as what was, what was brought up, expecting that more things would grow afterwards. It's the first fruits with expectation of what's to come. And anyways, with that, the first fruits is Stephanus in his household. So here's what it means. Stephanus had to get saved. When Paul went to Corinth, they were preaching the gospel. And you know who was the first people? If not possibly the first people were, were Stephanus and his family to get saved. What's he talking about here? He's talking about evangelism. Practically speaking, in, that, in a level that we should apply here, when we are applying the, the practice and principles of love, is that there's a necessity of evangelism. That's our first point, is number one, is that it should be a loving, evangelizing church. That's what it should be. Stephanus and his family, first fruits, saved. In fact, back in chapter number one, describes that Paul even baptized Stephanus personally. He hadn't really baptized people, and he said, yeah, except for these guys. But besides that, I haven't really baptized anybody. But he did baptize Stephanus. Why do you think that is? Because there's nobody else to baptize him. Somebody's got to baptize him, so he baptizes the guy. And so anyways, he gets, he gets saved, he gets baptized, and it's from there that we have the very first few converts that are there in, in Corinth. So think about it. The very first Christians that are in this community are from the household of Stephanus. Now, what does this mean? Well, first off, it points to the point, it first off points to the aspect that we ought to be doing this work, this first work of evangelizing, sharing the gospel. We do that as a church, and we ought to keep doing it. Listen, I hope never, it should never be said about our church that it's not a soul-winning church. This ought to always be a soul-winning church. And by the way, soul-winning doesn't mean that we only go out on Saturday mornings or on Wednesday mornings. It, what this means is that we're a soul-winning church all the time. You know when we tell people about Jesus? Everywhere. I mean, you look at the book of Acts and see how they did it. They went everywhere preaching and teaching Jesus. That's what they did, everywhere. You, we go to our restaurants, we go to our grocery stores. Anywhere we go, we can tell people about Jesus, and we should be. Our neighbors ought to know that you're a believer and they should know how to get saved. That's one of the realities of our Christianity is that we are preachers of the gospel anywhere that we go. Now, that should be the case here. When it comes to Stephanus, we don't know any information about how he got saved. Was it possible that Paul went to the synagogue and there, when it describes the people that had gotten saved, that maybe Stephanus was at the synagogue? Maybe he's one of the few that wanted to talk to Paul and say, hey, I got some questions for you. Would you come over to my house? And he, Paul leads them to the Lord. We don't know the story as far as what happened, but we do know this, that, that Stephanus did get saved. And um, in any ways, it was because of an evangelistic drive of Paul to get out there and share the good news of the gospel to them. So if we ought to be evangelizing, here's what we have to remember. You have to remember that punctuation from, from verse number 14, colon. Let all your things, your evangelism, let all your things be done through charity. Oh, I'm sorry, with charity. Uh, if your evangelism is not done with charity, then it could be even carnal, could it not? You can evangelize for carnal purposes. We could. You know, we, we, we track uh, soul winning statistics here and, and partly kind of want to see um, what's going on with what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it's actually been really encouraging because um, sometimes we'll go to apartment complexes and we go to apartment complexes and in, in like two hours, a bunch of people get saved. And or, you know, uh, a week ago, three people got saved on, on uh, soul winning at an apartment complex. We we're out there for an hour and a half. And so I thought that was pretty great. But then we'll go to a neighborhood that's kind of spread out more and you go to some nicer houses and people that are spending more on property and things like that. And less people get saved over the course of like four hours. I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? Well, these statistics actually helped us, not for the sake of like, okay, well, we're going to 
mathematically lead more people to Jesus. That's not how it's worked out. What we are saying is, like, what are we doing as far as our trends and how, how are we doing it? What can we do a better job at getting the gospel out there? And what we found is that statistically, rich people, poor people get saved at the same rate. As people hear the gospel, they get saved. Now, here's what happens, though. When you go into a property that's a large property, a couple acres big and big, huge, beautiful houses, and you go to properties that are smaller and run down, whatever it may be, here's what we do have is that uh, when they're smaller properties, we can get to them faster. That's all it is. We can, we can just a bunch of them. But then uh, when you get properties that are bigger, it takes you several minutes between properties. In the meantime, you could have knocked on five different doors, and, uh, and, and ultimately it, it, would, it would have been a little different um, just because of the size of properties. Rich, poor, his cultures, black, white, Hispanic, they all receive the gospel the same way. It doesn't matter. And so when we, we think about all this kind of stuff, um, what we realize is like it just works to preach the gospel. That's it. But here's what we could do. Here's what we could do. We can start adding these things. Okay, what we need to do is we, uh, we've knocked on, what, 900 and some houses. Justin, do you remember the, the numbers on that one? Nine, 906 or almost 1,000 doors this, this year so far, which you have to remember, it's been cold. Okay, it's been really cold. And some of those, those houses, hundreds of those houses have been knocked in, in weather below 30. Okay, so in freezing temperatures, we've knocked on a bunch of houses. And we could say, okay, you know, what we need to do statistically, uh, we need to knock on twice as many doors so that way more people get saved. And then we start notching them off. And then we can start going to meetings and tell, telling people, this is how many people were leading to the Lord. How many are you guys leading to the Lord? We could start, do, we could start doing that. And by the way, it's not without precedent. We, we know that happens. And what's important is it's not for that. Why should we be going door to door? Is it so Charity Baptist Church can have a great name? No, it's because the, 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 the groom, Jesus Christ, he ought to have a great name. And it should be for him. In other words, with charity, for the sake of his name and for the souls that are perishing, they need to hear the gospel. And since they need to hear the gospel, it's for that purpose. And at any time when we get our flesh in the way and we want to lead more people to the Lord more than that person, and we want to be able to do it better than that person or better than this ministry or whatever, then we got in the way. And it doesn't work that way. It has to be that we're preaching the gospel with charity. In other words, for their benefit, not for my own at all. With charity, an evangelizing church. Secondly, we must be a serving church. Look at the way they were. So when they got saved, these are the very first people that got saved there. These are the first fruits there in Achaia. What did they do? According to this, in verse number 15, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. This is awesome. Why is it awesome? Because these people got saved, and you know what they did? They just got hooked on serving Jesus. That's what they did. Sometimes we think that the only people that will really love Jesus are the people that, that they dress right and they come from the right background. They maybe knew a lot of Bible beforehand. And, and then they've been going to church a while and now they're doing right for Jesus. And here's what God is saying here. That, these, that Stephanus and them, they got saved and they addicted themselves. In other words, they couldn't stop. They couldn't help but to serve Jesus. This is what's important. And that is something that's of vital importance. He's saying, boy, that's what they were like. That ought to be the character of believers. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Oh, I've been saved for a long time, or I've tried this thing and it didn't work for a while. It's worth it to live for Jesus now. You might say, well, I've only been saved a week or a month or a year or, or a few years, or I don't know a lot of the stuff. You can addict yourselves to the ministry. It's a lot better than being addicted to anything else, isn't it? Anything can addict you. I, I, I'd imagine in a room like this, we get a lot of people addicted to uh, Internet. And I don't even mean like all the bad stuff. I'm just saying you're like a blog reader and you can't help yourself from, from following stuff online or, or Facebook. I can't tell you how many people just like cannot get off of Facebook. They're just stuck to it or what, one of the other things to it. You're addicted to it. And you, you, you can be addicted to ministry. You can surely be addicted to other stuff. And what God is saying is Stefan sets that example there and his family, not just him, but they addicted themselves they were fully devoted with intensity that's what the word addicted means um, to ministry now in the way you see the ministry here it's a ministry of the saints this is the ministry characteristic of and also to other believers their initial and their immediate uh, consequence for their salvation was such that they needed to serve others they needed to serve other believers they needed to help them they need to edify them they need to encourage them and build them up and and do what they needed we need to be zealous of ministry. Our church, all of you, you say we love people. Praise God for that. In fact, isn't that the name of our church? Charity 
Baptist Church, we even use it as a tagline, love God, love church, love Indy. And that doesn't mean that we want to put heart stickers everywhere. That means that we're going to addict ourselves to the ministry of the saints. That's what we're going to do. We, we need to be doing this. There needs to be some practical application. We're actually serving. We're actually doing the things we're supposed to do. Um, furthermore, uh, we, we look at, uh, I'm sorry, one, one more thought on this one. The, the term, as far as uh, that they serve, they addict themselves uh, <clears throat> to the ministry of the saints. The term ministry is the same, excuse me, <clears throat> the same word that would be used to describe uh, the deacons. Uh, now, this is not positional deacons. Literally, it's just a practice of the deacons. Now, there are deacons and deaconesses all throughout the church. As far as people that serve, it's not, it's not meaning the official position of deacons that you would find earlier on in the book of Acts, but simply people that are serving. Who should be serving? Everybody. That's what all of us should be doing. it. Well, they're really good at it, and they're more patient. That's true. But you should still be serving. All of us should be serving. This should be zealous for all of us. Uh, and here's the really good news about this. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Look, when you serve God, when you are serving in charity, in love for other people, God remembers it. We have a just God who remembers the things that you're doing. You don't have to worry about the recognition. Some of us don't want to do things because we're afraid nobody would see it. Listen, that's perfect because there's only one person that you should be getting their attention. That's God's, which ye have showed toward his name and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We have the promise of God. We have eternal life. We have the adoption of saints. We have this. And so we serve knowing that God sees it. And that's why we serve, out of charity, for love for him, and a regard for others. Thirdly, look at the submission to those that labor. Again, in the same ver- um, I'm sorry, in the next verse, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such. Who should you submit yourselves to? Those people that were addicted to serving. Those people. Now, we oftentimes bypass this one because there's a lot of different submissions that it talks about. Uh, in Ephesians, the, the favorite one amongst men is wives submit yourselves unto your own husband. That's what women should do. They should submit to their own husbands. Except it's mentioned much more before that because it talks about submitting one to another in the fear of the Lord. Right? We, we submit to each other. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about submitting to our parents. In Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, it talks about submitting to government. In 1 Peter 5, it talks about uh, the younger submitting to the older all those things are mentioned, but we can't negate the fact that God commands in this passage a practical application of charity, colon, practical application is this, to submit. Submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. These people, Stephanus and his household, as well as the other people serving, we ought to submit to them. So, practically, what does this mean for us? Well, he's been addressing back from chapter number three that we're yet carnal, uh, for whereas, uh, verse number three, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men, for while one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Look, we have our carnal favorites, the things that we like the most. Some of you like that type of preaching that screams at you and like, yes, that's what I like. And some of you are like, oh, I really like the guy that's more eloquent with terms. And you're not getting either one. So what, way we're like, what are we going to figure out? Well, I like that preacher. I like this one. So that's what we like. And here's what he's saying in these things. All of these we submit to the people that are serving. We submit to people. Now, should we submit to like pastoral authority and stuff like that? There's an element there in regards to the aspect of ruling decision making in the church. But he's talking further that we ought to be submitting to one another who are serving. Uh, these are the ones that are serving. They're actively serving. They're doing what they're supposed to for Jesus' name's sake. Uh, we should be actively listening to those who are actively serving. Why? Because you should also be doing the same thing. Now, it doesn't matter. Well, that person's only been saved a few years, and I've been saved for 125 years. Well, if that's the case, are they serving in a way that you're not serving that you can learn from? You need to submit to them. You need to submit to them because they're doing something that you're not doing. And so there's a necessity then of submitting. Here's the thing. I said, well, I disagree with that. It says it in scriptures. It's not saying it's any positional thing. It's literally that people like Stephanus were serving. There is another aspect, though, as well, that there are some people that have been serving a long time. And he does say, while well, we should be sur- submitting one to another, he's also going to give the component here that there are some people that have been serving for a long time. 
So now that's where you get to the whole point where I've been saved for hundreds of years and, and they've only been saved a while. There is that aspect where those of you that have been serving for a long time, there's a number of you that have been serving for a long time, that the, uh, the rest of the church ought to be submitting to you, that you have more sway in what you're saying, not because now you're more important, but literally that you are to be honored. And here's what I'm telling you. It's not for the sake of those of you that have been serving for a long time, but I tell our younger Christians, I would speak to teenagers and young Christians and people that have been saved just a while. Maybe you're newer here at the church. Here's what I would instruct you to do. Find the godly people in the church and learn from them. Learn from them. How, how is it that they're having victory over certain sins? How is it that they're growing? You ought to be submitting yourselves to them. The idea of submission would put you in a different relationship with individuals where you become a pupil, where you become a student, where you become one that would even serve the people that, that have been around for a while. Stephanus, first fruits. He's been around a while, early on. This is not a very old church, but regardless, early on in Christianity, as far as that church goes, they need to learn from him. They need to submit to that, that, that individual and that family as well. And, uh, and it is those that are serving. By the way, we should be all serving, which means this is not dependent on your age, but your length of service does matter. You should be serving a long time. And I hope amongst our older, our older church membership that you continue serving. And you oftentimes will receive where you may not be able to do some of the things you used to do. You can still serve people that are willing to learn from you and to submit to you. Uh, so that way you can instruct them on the way you should do. Ladies, let me encourage you to instruct younger ladies in the way that they should abide in their own homes as far as how they should be serving in their own homes and how they ought to be uh, treating their families and raising their children and, and treating their husbands and reverencing them. You know who, who has that role? A pastor can talk about that, but, but practically the older ladies will teach the younger. That's what needs to be taking place, and this is one of the examples that we see here. Men, likewise, we understand that their fathers are supposed to be teaching the young men but young men, you have to take this action of submitting to people that have been doing those things. And unfortunately, that's one of the things we don't like to do. Why? Because they're boring. They sit at home and we want to get out there and do the stuff. You need that example from them. And so submit. Uh, number four, look at verse number 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. This is a cool name. Some of y'all need to name your children that. Justin and Emily, if you guys have a, uh, a boy, you guys need to name him that. All right. And, uh, or the next, I, I would say the next one, but I can't say it well. Achaicus a- 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 or something like that. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, a- 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 acknowledge, ye that, and acknowledge ye them that are such. And so here's on this next one. There's an aspect of encouragement. We ought to, in charity and love, be an encouraging church. Yes, we should be evangelistic. We should be serving. We should be submitting, and we should also be encouraging. As a church, this is vital. One of the things that's necessary as a church is uh, to remember that we do need some refreshing. And, and how often do we, need, do we need that refreshing? All the time. Or whenever it comes up, whenever we need it. Uh, I think of our sister, uh, Miss Doris. We're, we're praying for her. She needs people to come alongside her. Can all of us do everything that Miss Doris needs? No, but some of us can. Here's what we need to do. We need to help those people do those things. We, we need to be there. We need to be present for them. And, uh, and there are individuals in this one. He says that Corinth, there are, you, there's ways you've helped me, but you lacked in some of these things. And some of you from there did come over. Who came over? Stephanus, I assume, being the same Stephanus mentioned in verse number 15. Uh, and then the other two, which I won't say their names. All right, so... Uh, I was going to give them nicknames, but I can't think of good ones. So anyways, uh, you, ha- you have the next two, that th- these three people that came, and they brought what was needed, and they gave what was good. And it says in verse number 18 that they, they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Because as the body of Christ is helped, it helps the entire body. And so this is what they're doing. And as they're helping them out, it says, um, therefore, uh, uh, acknowledge ye them that are such. And so what he's saying is honor them in those things. And so, yes, there are people that are encouraging and exhorting. They ought to be honored. Encourage people that are doing that. You find individuals in the church that are helping others. Encourage them in that. Honor them. Help them accomplish those things. Uh, those are things that are needed because we all need that. We're in a battle, right? You ever get worn out in a battle? Uh, anybody wrestle? How many of you wrestled before, like in high school? No, we have a non-wrestler. We have one wrestler. All right. Um, any other contact sports? Uh, anything else? 
Football. All right. All right. So with football, uh, it wears you out, doesn't it? Even practicing, just wearing the pad, being in the sun, and you need something like refreshing. And oftentimes what's going to be, I, I remember in football, one of my favorite things uh, during the summer was when they tell you to go get a drink. <laughs> and like we're just working out, but we weren't allowed to in the meantime, which I'm pretty sure is illegal now. Um, but in the meantime, we'd be practicing. We'd be doing you know, a, couple, a couple things a day and, and uh, two a day and stuff like that. And we can go to the water horses, which we're not fancy. We're talking about like PVC pipe connected to a, a uh, hose and there's just holes drilled in it. And at one point they turn it on and that's what you would do. He's like everybody would like fight to drink and you get exhausted fighting to get a spot at drink because after a certain amount of time they turn it off again. And so you didn't get it, you didn't get it. And um, we didn't lose anybody, but I, I feel like that's dangerous, especially in like the hot California sun. Anyways, we'd go out there, but we needed that. And sometimes it was just enough for the coach just to tell us. That coach could yell at us and make us feel terrible. But then he says the phrase to go get a drink or water horses. And like, yes, we love you. You're our best friend. Be my best man. You know, whatever it may be, because you let us have water just for a moment, because we need that refreshing. Christians, we're in battles. We're, we're going through difficulties. We need that refreshing, that encouragement from other people. And if we're doing that, you need to be helping people do that as well, because not all of us can always do that. Uh, also, uh, number five is hospitality. We need to be a hospitable church, a loving, hospitable church. Everybody generally in our culture says hi, but that's about it. Uh, oftentimes, we want to feel, make somebody feel welcome. What we'll do is we'll give them the handshake or the smile. The idea of hospitality would be of caring. It's interesting. One of the words that you'll find in that term hospitality is that word hospital. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that they come in here battered and worn and all that kind of stuff or injured even or infirm. But the point is it's a place of refuge that allows people to have the care that's needed for them, right? They have an opportunity to be cared for, to be sent on their way, to do what's supposed to. You're not supposed to go and live at the hospital, which is a really good analogy if you're hosting people at your house. They're not coming there to live, right? Just remember, this is temporary. They're not going to stay there, which means you can lock a door, right? And uh, just shove your mess into there and have them come on over. You're allowed to do that. The point on this one, though, when it comes to hospitality, is that there are people that are hospitable, and it's a characteristic of the church that they were. Was it the whole church that was that way? No, but he does give an example. Who's the example in verse number 19? The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their home. And so this is what Aquila and Priscilla do. They've been with Paul. In fact, that's a neat study. I've heard of one time uh, at a, a couple's retreat where you followed the line of Aquila and Priscilla as far as everywhere they were following them through the book of Acts. And they're everywhere that Paul is. And, and, and uh, when he, they're not, he acknowledges them just constantly. In fact, he talks about the debt that we have to Aquila and Priscilla for the work that they did with Paul, a husband and a wife combo. And when the church gets started there in Philippi, I believe, or Ephesus, uh, depending on where it was written from, I, I believe it was written from, um, from Philippi. Whenever this was done there, Aquila and Priscilla had moved there from Corinth, and they have a home, and they allow the church to start in their home. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to think that um, it's inconvenient to have a church meet in your home. Imagine if we're like, hey, uh, government says we're no longer allowed to meet, and so we're all going to go to Matt's house, and we're going to meet there. And uh, so we're going to just pile into his living room we may have to have a conversation. Matt's like, sure, come on over. Um, something would be missing. Any of you married men know this, all right? Your wife needs to give permission, all right? And, and I'll do that. Sometimes I'll talk to people like, yeah, come on over. My wife's like, um, we are doing 45 other things that day. Um, we can't do it. It's like, oh, no problem, no problem. Well, no, it's because it's inconvenient. Uh, bathrooms get messy, and they get, I mean, they get bad, all right? We try to keep clean bathrooms, and... Um, it doesn't take long with a few people to visit where bathrooms are not clean. And I don't mean like mud gets tracked in, okay? I mean like it gets not clean. And so now there's cleaning, there's organized and putting stuff away. Kids come over and we're like hiding the stuff because our, our kids, like they've learned to realize certain things are only ornaments and other people come over and they're like, oh, there's toys. No. And so there, there's, there's a process and things that it could be inconvenient. But the point is Aquila and Priscilla had made something where now their life was about hospitality. Oh, they can't because of all X, Y, Z. No, no. Well, how about we make some adjustments in our Christianity where we can have people over, where we can invite people. Let me encourage you to go for, in hospitality from, um, from just a handshake and a smile to welcoming. The idea of hospital, uh, hospitality is to let them in. 
In fact, furthermore, hospitality gives the idea of, of a, a kindness to strangers. These are not just your friends. We're okay with our friends coming over. Uh, we had some friends over last week, and like, ah, we didn't even have to clean. They're coming over. Uh, they know us, you know. But the point is that when it comes to strangers and other people, there's some extra work that goes into that, making sure that things are met in the, and the needs are met in the proper way. Hospitality is for the purpose of investing. In Titus chapter 3, it says, Bring Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. In other words, hey, we're going we're gonna to help send them on their way. We're preparing them. We're equipping them. We're edifying them and making sure we can invest in other people like Titus is encouraging them to do. So encourage those people. With that, get, in, get hospitable with the people in church. Start inviting people over. Say, I've never done that before. You do not have to have a five-course meal when you have people over. You don't. You, you can have chips. You can have water. You know, people still drink water, generally. Some people don't. But you can still, and you don't have to have food. I mean, tech, typically we'll, we try to have some good customs, some Western customs that demonstrate some hospitality, like in giving somebody something to, to drink when they come over to your home. That's, that's hospitable. And, and I think it's important to teach that kind of stuff. I think it's helpful. We need to teach that. Uh, ladies, it's one of the things you can teach people to do is how to host people in your home. It's a lost art. It, 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 outside the church, it's just not known how to do it, honestly. It's just not known at all how to do it. Uh, we do weird things. Some of you notice, for instance, we stand up when, when ladies come up on stage. How often do people stand for you when you walk into a room, ladies? It, it just doesn't happen much. But if you're in a couple on stage, we're going to give you the honor of standing up for you. might make you feel awkward. I remember in college, I had a Sunday school class of 600 men. It's a lot of men. And then the ladies group would stand up. And uh, you had about 600 single guys stand up, not like they're looking for a date, but just out of respect. That's what we were supposed to do. And uh, it was really weird because you hear <laughs> just a whole crowd of people stand up. And then when they sit in these bleachers, it would just sound like thunder. And then they would sing for us. But... Um, but, but ultimately, the point is to demonstrate some respect. And, and when people come over, show them some respect. Go out of your way for them. Be willing to provide for them, even to the point where it would be at a cost for you, because you're investing. You're investing in them. Make sure that you're active in regards to your hospitality. You demonstrate the love of Christ to everyone. And by the way, that also means guests that come in. It, it, it's sometimes interesting that um, when people come in, we, um, well, okay, sometimes it's always interesting. We don't know people when they come in. You realize that but all of you were new at one point. All of you were new. And I hope that you felt welcomed, but furthermore, you need to also be welcoming them in as well. Stephanus, what, what, did, what did he do? When Stephanus, when he got saved, he addicted himself to the ministry of the saints. That also applies to the fact that he's ministering to saints. The, the first believers are like, yes, you need this as well, and starts inviting them in. There, there's a reality where there's a hospitality from him himself. I hope that you guys are hospitable to other people. When guests come in here, I love when people are greeting them and shaking their hands. You know, people come in and they, they don't really know what to do sometimes. I remember as a, uh, as a teenager, I'd come into church and I hadn't really been. Now, in Catholic church, everything was incredibly formal. So, we'd, you know, certain things would be said and we would say amen or um, I can't remember the phrases anymore. I've been been removed uh, we kneel down when we we're supposed to we just we had we had the time frame and, it was, and everything had to be quiet it was very very quiet then i go to a baptist church and it's not the same people are saying things in the service they're like amen what in the world's going on here and uh and people are moving around sometimes and and uh and, and it's not as 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 um i don't want to say it's not sacred it's not as um stiff okay <laughs> there we go it's not as stiff there's nobody coming in there with big robes or anything like that and uh, you don't have statues staring at you that feel like they're going to attack you or something like that. And so I'm just like, okay, there, there's something different here. But you know what? I had no idea, so I would just act differently. And so I remember, I still remember uh, where I would stand up. Like I'd be in the second or third row on this side, and, and I would stand up and like, you know, kind of uncomfortable, fix my pants a little bit and fix my shirt and sit down. I, the pastor would be preaching, stand up, rearrange, sit down, right? That's a little distracting, all right? Uh, I'm not paying attention. The past was struggling to pay attention. And I only did that on a weekly basis, so it wasn't like all the time. But I remember my mom finally saying, you know, at the church, you need to sit and pay attention. You know, and when, when he speaks, and sometimes I'd talk to other people. I didn't do that at the Catholic church or at school as much. But regardless, uh, my mom's like, no, we need, to, we need to have some respect. And remember, we need to conduct ourselves in a certain way when we come to the house of God. But those are things that need to be taught, and we have to teach them. And listen, people are going to come in here, and they don't have, they don't know the the right way. They don't realize the part should be on the um, right side, right side of the head. Um, they don't. They don't realize the size Bibles are supposed to carry, or how a suit should properly fit, or or that you know the right type of socks. That certain rock socks are cool. Some socks that don't match as well are okay, but certain ones are not. They make all sorts of rules. That's kind of silly stuff. But the point is, 
we need to learn those things. It takes some time, and all of you have to learn it, all of you, whether as children, as adults, all of us. And so let me encourage you, be hospitable, be welcoming, give people a place of refuge, help send them on their way. It is not for you to be condescending. Why? Because this hospitality should be done in charity with great love for them, not your frustration. In other words, if you're trying to get people to be quiet, like kids that are running up and down the aisles, it's not out of frustration. Just be quiet. No, it, it, we do so because it's for their sake. They're, they're never going to learn this type of manner and this type of behavior. Help the moms out. Encourage them, not just because your kids need to get in line. They're learning. We keep our kids in here so they can learn how to sit in church and how they can learn. And so there's much there. Last one uh, is affection. All right, this is a weird one. Ready? Verse number 20. All the brethren, all the brethren greet you with, I'm sorry, greet you. Let me start over. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with a holy kiss. So here's what it says. Hey, all the other churches and these people, these brethren are saying, hey, everybody, hi. They all want to say hello. They send their wishes. And by the way, you guys kiss each other. You know, it's one of those things where we're like, well, we shouldn't. Uh, I believe in the literal interpretation of scriptures. Well, I look at this one. I'm like, I don't know about this one. You know, maybe not as literal. But th the concept up here is something that is the practice of a greeting, of also welcoming. Uh, we don't welcome each other with a holy kiss any longer. Uh, we, we do so in different ways. I, there was a uh, guy I knew in a church when I was in California that, um, that he would greet people with a holy kiss, just not men. All right, he would, he, would greet, he would greet certain women with a holy kiss on Sundays. All right, now there is a point where, like, there could be a cultural issue, except for, like, it lasted one time, and then the uh, husbands didn't really like that, and... And uh, I'm assuming the women didn't like that either because they were pretty upset about it. And anyway, so, no, we, we, we're, not, we're not kissing. But, but here, here's the point. Uh, when you look at the word kiss in the scriptures, almost every single time, every single time has to do with actually like a, uh, a brotherly-like type kiss. In other words, that type of relationship, whether either a father to son or brothers or friends, uh, best friends even, people that are in close relation. This is an acceptance. This is a welcome. Um, there's only two times that the term is used in regards to a, a, a man and a woman, a husband and wife, and that's actually in the Song of Solomon. All right, the rest of the stuff has to do with, with relational stuff as far as friendship, the demonstration of friendship and acceptance and welcoming. And so, uh, anyways, we, we express it in different ways. Now, for us, that would be like a handshake. Um, some of you may go as far as a hug. All right, now, hugs, we're still careful with that. I might bro hug a guy or something like that if, you know, that's, that's it, just being more cautious there. But the point on that is that the, the, us, that's the idea of that acceptance. We do this in different ways through our verbal affirmation of individuals by that welcome. Yes, we do that smile, although you can't see it with masks on. But regardless, you, you have that and you, you have handshakes. All, the, all those are things in which we're greeting, we're accepting one another as a family. We are close to each other. And so if we're doing this, we're demonstrating genuine interest, expression of affection. We call each other things like brother. And sister, why? Because that's where we are, and it's a, that's a term of endearment that we have w with each other, and that should be something that's important, uh, that, that's communicated here. And so he's expressing that this is what a church ought to be like, family. So last, last part, just to finish the, the text here for the, the book. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. In other words, saying I'm writing this part on my own. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Those, that's literally Greek terms that were transliterated straight into English and other passages. They're, they're interpreted, but we understand this is the Bible. Um, the term anathema has the idea of let him be accursed. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. All right, so those are two things, but those, those are important phrases. What he's addressing here is um, he, he's given this, this exhortation, and I think this is a strong exhortation for any of us. Here it is. Um, when we're talking about love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, the idea here is in, regard, in relation to the person of Christ, there is a non-relationship there. If we could say it this way, if there's anybody here that's not saved, they need to be saved, otherwise they're cursed. Here, if I could put it this way, this stuff doesn't apply to you. All, all of chapter 1 through, third, through one, 1 through 16 doesn't apply if, if you're not saved. Now, he's not saying, well, I don't know. I don't know if I love God enough. What he's talking about, uh, and, and I, I hate to use Greek for this, but, but the term that's used here is not having to do with a, like a selfless love, but literally a relational love that's there, something that gets entered into. In other words, I need him as my savior. We enter into a relationship. What he's saying here is there's an absence of that relation. That, that's not there. So what he's saying, you're not saved. Now, he's not suggesting like, well, there's some evidences in your life that you're, you're not holy enough or you're not 
close enough to God, you're, you're not reading your Bible enough, or you're not doing a lot of loving, loving things. This expression here, specifically to those people that don't have a relationship with God, who have not trusted in Christ as Savior, get saved. Otherwise, you're cursed. You're cursed. Literally, you would be doomed to an eternity in hell forever. The term anathema is very strong. Cursing, it, it, it's used in several other passages of Scripture as far as accursed. People that go into a pledge of like how they're going to destroy Paul, and if not, to let him be accursed. And, and this is what they're saying, that they would be doomed forever. That's what it is. In context of, in light of something very important, Maranatha, he's coming. He's coming. Listen, this is how pertinent it is. This is how important he is. This is don't, don't wait on this kind of thing. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. Jesus died for you. That's why we love. We love him because he first loved us. That's why we do so. But it doesn't matter if you're not saved. Jesus died for you because your sins need to be paid for. And so he paid for them for you. He rose again, secures your salvation. This is what Jesus Christ did. And you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you. Same thing I did when I was 15. I'm a sinner and I deserve hell, but I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Please save me. I acknowledge that he rose again as well. I finished the prayer with, thank you for saving me. And I was saved. I was done forever, forever. And you know, I love God. I love God because he saved me. I love not because if I keep loving him, then I'll stay saved. But literally, I entered into that relationship with him. He saved me. He became my heavenly father. And so now I'm saved. If you're not saved, what he's saying is get saved. Why? Jesus is coming. There will be a moment where it's too late. And that literally what he's going to be addressing more in regards to his coming has to do with the coming judgment, in which you will see Jesus. And he will judge the living and the dead. That's what he's going to do. So get saved. And then for believers in verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. I love how he inserts at the end. I love you. That's what he's saying. And it's not just that I love you, but think about it. Think about it. The whole book has been about that. You're messed up. Love would fix this because you have a wrong perspective. I love you. I'm writing this because I care about you. I'm doing this for your benefit. Would you do this because this is what you need? And so he greets us with, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is the epitome of what he's been addressing there in charity. And so, to us as a church, we have chosen. Now, there's, I don't think there's anybody here that was here with the. In fact, there's nobody here that was here with the choosing of the name Charity Baptist Church for our local body. But this is still a church that you chose to be at, as the Lord has placed you here. And, uh, and that name ought to ring, ring true. And it's not going to ring true if we're not doing these things within the context of the charity or the selfless love, outward love, of how these things should be applied. And so we ought to be a loving evangelistic church, a loving serving church, a loving submissive church, a loving encouraging church, a loving hospitable church, and a loving uh, affectionate church. We should be those things. And if we're not, that term charity, Baptist church, should just be Baptist church. This is the body of doctrines that are right. But we're saying charity. This is the outward application of those things. I hope this is true of you. And if you're here and you're not saved, you need to be saved. You have to be saved. Why? anathema i mean this is this is a coming judgment that's coming to behold christ will not be a good thing for you because that'll be literally a, a, a judgment uh, an eternity in hell but for those of us who are saved let's abide in the love that god has called us to the grace of god the grace of jesus christ be on you all listen i love you paul saying i love you i hope that you're loving others as well let's pray let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes we'll pray uh, i ask um as i pray i'm going to ask a couple questions um First question is, is there anybody in this room that says, I have not been saved, but I need to be, I need to be, I need to, I need to place my faith in Jesus Christ to save me. I've never done that before, and right now I want to enter into that. I want, I want, I want to be saved. I want to accept what Jesus did for me, paying it completely for all of my sins, rising again. That's me. I want to make the decision today. Is there anybody with a raised hand that says, I want to make the decision today, but I've not done that before, and I want to? Anybody at all? And then this, and I ask this question, how is your life reflective of the name of our church? We're Baptist. Well, praise the Lord for that. But is it charity Baptist? Well, we're right about stuff. Well, is it charity in the manner in which you're communicating? How is your affection? Are there people that you don't even like? You don't want to be around in the church. Do you have affection for them? Do you have hospitality? Uh, you're hospitable. I, I think that should be a point of a conviction more than just a point of application. Literally, I, I need to be hospitable. I need to be encouraging. I need to be submitting. I need to be serving. I need to be evangelizing. That's me. You need to make a change on that today. Make that decision. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time you've given.